up you guys? I am filming from work today, so bear with me if there is a little background noise um, throughout the video. But today I actually wanted to address the um, conference that aired on C-SPAN last week. It took place actually exactly a week ago from today. Thursday, uh, June 2nd, um, and it was held by the American Enterprise Institute, um, and it was really, really cool to see. I know it's it's uh, been being passed around on Facebook, um, but I actually sat and watched the whole thing, took notes on the whole thing so that you guys don't have to, um, and there's a lot of really good information there. So if you are a business owner, I would definitely, definitely recommend, um, you know, watching, at least watching, really you should watch the whole thing to be honest because there's so much good information, but we'll go over it all um, here today. So there were a number of, um, AEI, American Enterprise Institute, uh, scholars that spoke out, um, you know, had different presentations and, and facts that they presented. Um, and they are all, they are all in favor of this industry. I mean, they all understand, um, the severe risk to public health should the government choose to go through with these regulations, um, and make it more difficult for companies to survive and the general public to continue to vape. So, um, it was really, it was really refreshing to see that kind of a perspective, um, you know, from from someone who is outside the industry for a change, um, and there was there was a lot of good information shared. So um, we're just going to go through it, you know, speaker by speaker. And um, if you guys have any questions or need any clarification, let me know. Um, on my WordPress blog, I actually have everything um, written out for you. So if you have any questions or want, you know, any more details that I've given here in the video, definitely go and check it out. I'll put that link um, down below in the description of this video. So the first speaker was Saul Schiffman. He is a psychology professor from the University of Pittsburgh. Um, and he was giving kind of more of an overview of what the industry um, is, is doing to combat uh, just the poor statistics with traditional smoking. Um, he said that 500 million people will die from cigarettes this year. Um, smokers who do not attempt to quit will face a 50-50 chance of dying prematurely. So a lot of these facts we kind of, you know, we already know. Um, but he said the public is misinformed on the supposed danger of e-cigs by the media, by scientists, and the CDC. People are not getting accurate information right now um, as to, you know, the actual benefits of vaping when compared to smoking. Um, he said that a lot of the studies that they do with, um, you know, saying when they're talking about like kids and, and, and their exposure to vaping or their use of e-cigarettes, what they're not telling you is that they're not they're not basing it upon kids who are you know who have had a single puff in their life versus kids who are regularly vaping so even if a kid has just tried it once they're including them in that study um, and not really specifying that these aren't kids who are vaping um, you know regularly so that's a little bit misleading um, Nearly 75% of kids that have tried e-cigarettes were previously smokers. So there is not really, it, it's it's not that kids are out there saying, oh, look at these e-cigarettes, I want to try them. I've, you know, I've never been a smoker, but I want to try this. It's kids that were already smoking. So regardless, kids are already doing something that's bad for their health. And in a way, it's kind of helping them um, to, you know, get away from all of the, the chemicals and, and the tar and everything negative associated with cigarettes. Um, with the rise of e-cigarettes, there has been a decline in teen smoking, so this actually negates the gateway effect um, because it's proven now that one is not directly linked to the other. Um, 
and also from federal data, quit attempts among adults is much higher in the last year. Um, they did say that teen non-smokers are not interested in e-cigarettes because of the flavors. It's actually the adults that are drawn to e-cigarettes because of the flavors. Um, so that also, uh, you know, kind of negates the whole federal perspective that these flavors are, you know, drawing in kids. It's not really the kids that, that care about it. It's the adults because it's helpful in, in helping them to quit smoking. Um, Dr. Sally Sattel went next. She is a resident scholar for the AEI. She's also a staff psychiatrist for Partners in Drug Abuse Rehabilitation and Counseling. Um, and she was, she was basically just saying, you know, smoking for teens and adults are at the lowest rate ever in history, um, which obviously we can, you know, attribute to e-cigarettes. Um, the FDA is utilizing an overcautious approach, in my opinion, for a harm reduction product. So, um, and that was kind of her stance, the whole, the whole thing is just that, you know, everybody agrees that there needs to be some sort of regulation, um, but at the same time, not nearly to this degree as, as the deeming regulations. And she did mention that two tobacco companies, Altria and Philip Reynolds, both make e-cig products. Um, moving on, Julian Morris, he is the research vice president of the Reason Foundation. Um, and what I loved about him was that he was super animated, so excited, like he was so into e-cigarettes. He's so like, like just personally kind of invested and, um, his enthusiasm was so awesome to see throughout his presentation. He was definitely the most like into it of any of the speakers. So that was cool. Um, but he basically gave a, a rundown from start to, to present on, you know, how this all came about. And where this all started was that in 2004, a, Chine, a Chinese scientist, Han Leek, invented the Ruyan Sigalike, sig um, which was a cartridge with a cigarette holder, an atomizer, a battery, and an indicator lamp. Um, it was reinvented with the heating coil, which became the first e-cigarette released under his company Golden Dragon Limited, um, and the brand Ruyan, which means smoke-like. Um, it was a tobacco-like flavor and didn't burn the liquid, rather it vaporized it. Um, in 2008, the Gamuchi cartomizer came along, and that combined the cartridge and atomizer with e-liquid and connected directly to the battery. So it was a simpler, more effective uh, design than the earlier three-part design of the Ruyan. Um, Matt and Ted Rogers in 2008 also came out with the screwdriver mod, which was more power, longer lasting, um, used a flashlight battery. Um, and that's when it, you know, became known as a mod. Um, all three parties were originally consumers. They were not manufacturers. Um, then Joytech came along with the Ego also in 2008, and that's where things really took off. In 2009, they came out um, with the Ego T battery with Clearomizer, and that's where you found your refillable device and where, you know, e-liquids and everything kind of exploded. So, I mean, that's 2009. That's not the you know, that's far after the predicate date of 2007. So the only thing really that was on the market was the Ruyan Sigalike, which is nothing compared to um, what is so popular and, and utilized today. Um, A recent study of 2,807 current vapors found that the newer models are more effective and preferable than the older models, obviously. Um, over half of adult ENDS users use refillable tanks. So 60.3% of vapors surveyed use refillable tanks. Um, only 24.3% use cartridge-based devices, and 15.4% use disposable devices. Um, 
They also surveyed adolescents ages 13 to 17, 78.9 used refillable tanks, 10.5 used cartridge-based devices, and 10.5 used disposables. So that's perhaps where the government is kind of um, sticking it to the refillable devices. Um, a UK study did show that fruity flavors are the second largest category of flavors consumed by vapors. Tobacco is uh, the highest and menthol is the lowest. Um, sorry, there's a lot of information to kind of read through here. So in 2014, there was a study of 157 plus e-liquids. Over 74% of those tested showed significant quantities of diacetyl, um, and which is known, you know, as being associated with popcorn lung. Um, many manufacturers e-liquid. I mean, I'm sure that you guys remember what a stink that was. So all of us e-liquid makers went and you know started reformulating our recipes um, to you know lower those amounts. What? wasn't really made public is that the concentration of diacetyl in one cigarette is approximately eight times as much as the amount you would find in a day's worth of e-liquid. So there is a huge, huge difference here between vaping and traditional cigarettes, but that's not really a fact that was kind of made, uh, you know, it wasn't, you know, that, um, prevalent as, as some of the other data that was going on at the time. Um, regarding the regulations, no enforcement actions really in the next two years until August 8th, 2018. And um, Julian did pose the question, if you can make a mod out of a 3D printer, are they going to ban 3D, 3D printers? Uh, because if not, then you can see the market really changing where people are using, you know, other other available devices and materials to create mods um, to kind of further that section of the industry. Um, and he also debated the difference between banning liquids with nicotine versus no nicotine. If they don't, you know, contain nicotine, do they really fall under um, these regulations and should they really be regulated because they are not, in fact, a tobacco product or, or similar to a tobacco product if they don't have that nicotine. Um, and uh, he ended his presentation with the following quote, whatever you want to call them, e-cigs have huge potential and probably actually public health benefits. I think there's a grave risk that the FDA deeming regulations as they currently are going to be implemented will harm public health rather than help it. So. As long as they keep speaking out, we're, you know, we definitely welcome them. Uh, next was Stacy Ehrlich. She is the food and drug law attorney and outside counsel for the Council of Independent Tobacco Manufacturers of America. Um, and her job was really to kind of break down the regulations um, into kind of terms that we can all understand. Um, she said that the tobacco products, it's a very broad definition under the current statute. The so-called deeming regs serve to extend FDA jurisdiction um, over, you know, a huge category of products that they previously, you know, hadn't really had any jurisdiction over. Um, February 15th, 2007 is the predicate date, so that is the date that they are using right now. Um, to kind of regulate products. If you were on the market prior to that date, you do not fall under these regulations. But, you know, if you did release any products after February 15th, 2007, then you are um, subject to these deeming regulations. Um, the FDA review period, um, so there's, there's these, you know, we keep talking about these pre-market tobacco applications, the PMTAs, which everybody's gonna have to file for their products in order to stay on the market. Um, the FDA is estimating that they are going to have a review period of one year to get through all of these applications, which is ambitious at best. Um, products can stay on the market while they are awaiting review um, and approval, uh, but obviously if they don't get approved, then they have to be pulled immediately. 
Um, so in May, May 10th, 2016 of this year, the first lawsuit was filed. This is by Nico Pure Labs in DC. Um, and I kind of break down the difference between there's, there's three different lawsuits currently going on. Two are related directly to the vape industry. So you have Nico Pure, you have Lost Art Liquids, and then you also have a third lawsuit that was just filed May 26th, which was filed by Altria's uh, cigar brand, John Middleton Company. Um, that lawsuit is really based more around the FDA banning the use of the term mild uh, because that's used in the name of one of their cigars. But other than that, um, you know, Nico Pure and Lost Art are the only two um, current vape-related lawsuits uh, currently in progress. Um, the So there is the Regulatory Flexibility Act. What that does is it is requiring that examination is given with respect to the effect on small businesses, something that the FDA um, may or may not have considered, but regardless, um, hasn't really impacted their decision, you know, to release the, the deeming regs as they currently stand. Um, the Small Business Administration did file comments that unequivocally stated that the proposed rules of the Regulatory Flexibility Act analysis lacked info because it didn't give specific quantitative data on the impact to small business and FDA's response was no better. So basically, um, you guys have you know, not given concern to the effect on small businesses and where is the data um, to show that you care about the effect on small businesses. Um, this obviously includes the costs of the, the PMTAs and the other compliance measures um, and is going to have a huge impact on affecting not only manufacturers but also uh, brick and mortars and their ability to kind of um, survive. There are only four alternatives that the FDA has considered. Um, that is to exempt premium cigars, a 36-month compliance period for label changes, um, a 12-month compliance period for label changes, um, or an enforcement option of not extending the pre-market review compliance policy to new flavored tobacco products other than tobacco flavored products. So if they had left this unchanged, it would mean that all flavored tobacco products would have to be removed from the market by August 2016 until FDA order had been obtained. White House, The White House did intervene, though, and change this. Um, so... Some of the components that are covered under the deeming regs, obviously, are e-liquids. We've talked quite a bit about that. Um, atomizers, cartomizers, coils, batteries, digital displays, flavors, tank systems, software, bottles containing e-liquid, and glass vials containing e-liquid. Um, nicotine free e-liquids we've talked about this as well if it's intended or reasonably expected to be used with or for the human consumption of a tobacco product it is a tobacco product so just the fact that it could have nicotine even if it doesn't have nicotine it could so therefore it is a tobacco product um, and that is something obviously that, that the industry and, and the advocacy organizations are fighting as we speak um, and the FDA has expressed the intention to regulate entire lines of e-liquid, regardless of whether nicotine is included or not. So um, that was pretty much the gist of her presentation. Up next was Alex Brill. He is the former Republican chief economist and senior advisor for House Ways and Means Committee from 2002 to 2007. He is now a research fellow for uh, the American Enterprise Institute. Um, and really what he was focusing on was the uh, taxation for, for the industry moving forward. Um, 
he said that, you know, everybody pretty much agrees that there needs to be child safety requirements, but we need to kind of address that in a broader context, um, so not to harm or create greater harm to public health. Um, And we need to, yeah, I mean, basically encourage safety measures with e-cigs, but do not discourage tobacco smokers from switching. Um, the congressional attitude right now is really to separate out the predicate issue from the rest of it. The predicate issue is really kind of the biggest thing right now. As of today, we have 60 um, co-sponsors for H.R. 2058. We, the two newest ones, again, are Republicans. So we've got 60 current co-sponsors, and every single one of them is Republican. But what is... What is interesting um, is that he addressed kind of the difference in approach from the two different sides of Congress. He said on the right side, there's no uh, emerging support to advocate zero activity. And on the left, there's a general consensus for strong regulatory framework, but not outright prohibition. Um, the really the strongest support for change by Congress is embodied mostly by the Cole Amendment, um, and it was the most popular amendment that day in the House Appropriations Committee, and it passed 31 to 19. Two Democrats did actually vote in favor of the Cole Amendment. Um, afterwards, uh, in the U.S. Senate. After the deeming regs were released, Senator Murray, which is who is a ranking member on Senate Health Committee, um, and 16 colleagues wrote a letter praising the FDA. Um, they focused primarily on youth uh, with regards to marketing and restricting youth access. Um, they discussed concerns about flavoring and the malintentions of manufacturers that we are targeting children with um, our flavors. Uh, but absent from the letter was any any acknowledgement of the predicate date. So really, they're more focused on on kids, and you know, are we marketing to kids and making it easier for for kids to gain access? Um, you know, child safety caps are a must, so that you know, if adults with children in the home are vaping, um, kids aren't able to you know get access to you know these liquids with nicotine and whatnot. Um, and he did say that, you know, Republicans are basically looking for a deal to address safety concerns in exchange for their support. So once we get through kind of the, all the, the, um, arguments being made for, for changing the predicate date and, you know, changing some of the language in the um, deeming regulations, the next thing that Congress is probably going to tackle um, is taxation and, and how to handle taxation. Right now it's really being handled on a state level. You've got D.C., Arkansas, Louisiana, Kansas, and North Carolina who are already taxing ESIGs. You also have um, different local jurisdictions like Chicago and Montgomery County um, that have decided to issue their own um, taxation policies just on a um, kind of local level. Um, and then, of course, we're fighting them every day. I mean, it was just defeated in West Virginia. Now I hear uh, that it may be coming back. Um, Pennsylvania is trying to pass taxes. Um, Alaska, we've got, you know, the travesty that just happened in Indiana. So it's really important that everybody's getting involved with their uh, local and state reps to try to educate um, legislators so that, you know, they're not imposing these ridiculous taxes that will deter um, people from continuing to vape and also deter new vapors um, from or, yeah, new vapors from continuing to vape and, and not drive them back to uh, tobacco. So, I know this video is getting pretty long, so I'm going to try to rush through the rest of it. Um, Alan Verard is a, is 
a resident scholar for AEI as well, um, and he was the final speaker. Um, he's so this is really where targeted more towards the manufacturers. There's going to be three ways for a product introduced after February 15th, 2007 to remain on the market. One is to show that the product is substantially equivalent to a product that was on the market prior to the predicate date. Um, but what that means is you've got to essentially prove that your product is identical and has identical characteristics to, um, you know, a product that was on the date prior to that. Considering really it's just the Ruyon Sigalike, um, that's going to be very difficult to prove uh, for, for pretty much every vendor. Um, the regulations say that the manufacturer could choose a different category like combustible cigarette and try to show substantial equivalence to that, um, not by showing identical characteristics, but by saying it's similar in that there was uh, no question of, you know, harming public health. But he said it's not recommended because that is going to be an extremely, extremely, quote, arduous process. Um, the second would be to obtain an exemption from substantial equivalence. Um, the difference is the additive and product, and, and by demonstrating that the additive does not pose any health issues, this is going to be difficult to prove and likely to be set aside by the FDA. So the final one is to, as we've talked about, submit the pre-market tobacco application. Um, the standard for the applications are extremely stringent. By law, you have to provide information about your ingredients, your additives, your properties, the manufacturer, processing, labeling, and health risks. So in order to kind of meet all of these different requirements, not only is it going to be extremely costly, but it's also going to be extremely time consuming as well. Um, not a lot of people are going to be able to furnish the extreme details that the FDA is requiring. Um, it's going to require full-fledged clinical trials of, you know, the products in order to, to be able to make concrete affirmative proof that, hey, this isn't harmful to public health. Um, so it's, it's really, really going to be difficult to, to do this. And, and I, that's what not a lot of people are talking about. People are focusing more on the cost aspect, which, of course, is you know, very high, but you have to, you also have to take into consideration the number of um, details and data that is going to have to accompany that price tag, and, and even that is going to be super difficult to obtain as well. Um, he said that this is not a normal, and, and that this, this whole process, the PMTAs, the, the federal approval, this is not a normal requirement um, for American products, you know, as a whole. Um, they do have these same requirements for cigarettes, and that's really what they've modeled all of this after. Um, the February 15th, 2007 predicate date, he said, essentially protects cigarettes and allows them to stay on the market while effectively banishing e-cigs from our market. So really frustrating, discouraging stuff, but again, we've got people out there fighting. We're going to continue to fight. We're going to continue to make our voices heard, um, and one can only hope that if we apply enough pressure, um, the FDA will... will be forced to reconsider. Um, someone asked about, you know, then it moved into the Q&A section. Someone asked about vaping taxes. Um, kind of the, the overall consensus for the board was that lower taxes would lead to lower overall costs for health care, um, simply because people would be healthier. Rather than smoking, they would be vaping. Um, if you tax it super high, then people are likely to go back to cigarettes, um, and it's not, it's not going to be good for anyone, um, but it's also going to obviously affect costs for health care as well. Um, Alex, Alan Farrar did say that the states are, are trying to make up for revenue um, that they're losing through cigarette sales, so they're trying to replace that with e-cigarette taxes. Um, how do the U.S. regs compare to the approach from other countries? Uh, Julia Moore said, we are better than Australia, but worse than Europe. Saul Schiffman said, in Australia, they are banned. In Canada, they are banned, but not enforced. You still have brick and mortars everywhere. 
Um, but you, the UK is the jurisdiction we should really look to. Uh, they do see e-cigarettes as beneficial with a low burden um, and provide guidance to smokers to actually help them transfer over to e-cigs. Um, and that's, that's really what it is. We work with a distributor in the UK and we spoke with them the other day. Um, and they were saying, you know, it's really funny because we're going through um, some pretty, you know, stringent guidelines ourselves, but our focus here in the UK is more on public health and making sure that we are preserving public health. Um, in America, it seems the focus is more on uh, money and, and trying to, to make this a financially beneficial um, process for the government. So it just to kind of put that side by side as a comparison between what's going on here um, and, and over in the UK, it's certainly frustrating. Um, if the deeming date is changed, how does that affect the FDA's authority? Stacy or like she's our, you know, attorney on, on the panel said pretty much everything else would be applicable. The predicate date may be changed regarding the PMTA, but all other requirements would still apply. However, it's going to be much easier to prove substantial equivalence because Obviously, there's going to be all these other products that were already on the market before the predicate date, so that's kind of your main argument for staying on the market. Um, and Alan Verard said it really doesn't serve anyone to have any kind of predicate date whatsoever. Um, that's pretty much it. Um, there is, again, all of the details are written out on my blog, so make sure you go and read through all of that. Um, I know that there's a lot of information here. I know that it's it's pretty confusing, um, but really the most important thing is, you know, I want you guys to understand what we're facing and what the details are, but at the same time, um, I don't want you to get so caught up in, in reading into all the details and everything that you're not making time to show your support. Call, you know, your congressmen and your state legislators and even your local legislators, um, because as we've seen, this is happening on a local level as well. So you want to make sure that you're getting in touch with um, everybody and you're also showing your support to, um, you know, CASA and Safada and Not Blowing Smoke and the Vaping Association and all of these people um, that are working for us day and night, spending money out of their own pockets, you know, sacrificing time with their families um, to be out there fighting for us. So we in turn need to, you know, let them know that they have their you know, our support and they can count on us too. So, um, definitely let me know if you guys have any questions. I'm always happy to clarify anything. Um, and I will be back with new updates soon. Thanks for watching and I'll talk to you guys later.